Happy Sabbath. You all look well rested. That's good. Did you enjoy that praise and worship? Yes. That last song. Did you know Chloe could sing? Where did that come from, girl? That was beautiful. Oh, God is good. <laughs> um, welcome. Welcome to OC Grace. First, we want to learn to be an authentic expression of the kingdom of heaven. I learn to show grace everyone, everywhere, every time. If you're a visitor, welcome. We hope you got one of those visitor bags. Get a neat little cup. You did. Good. Uh, welcome. We hope this feels like home. We've been moving through Jonah in the series of the second of four teachings over Jonah. And last week, we understood that Jonah is written from a people who are still in captivity. They're still asking the question, when are we going to get home again? When are we going to have our own temple in which to worship when will our kids be able to run free? When are we going to be number one? That was the questions they were asking. So Jonah gives us some answers, but they're not answers that are easy to swallow. <clears throat> I, uh, yeah, I didn't actually intend to do that. I'm going to talk about something today that I struggle with, and I was talking a little bit with my wife about it. And some of you that know me, you know that when I talk about this, I am not preaching to you. Uh, and this may sound cliche, but there is a reason there's a cliche to it, because there's some truth to it. I'm speaking to me, because this is something I struggle with. And it's painful to get up front and talk about, but I'm going to do it, because I think that as I say it, maybe it'll give life to it, and maybe I can find healing just like some of you who also struggle with this thing. Are you ready? We're going to talk about doormats, doga, and open doors. And what I mean by all that is we're going to talk about submission. Let me pray with you. God, thank you. We praise you for allowing us to be here today. And Lord, as we continue to unravel some beautiful truths about this journey and in a new awareness of ourselves and who you are, we pray that, Lord, you will just help us to be patient as some of these truths are difficult. We thank you, Lord. Amen. So when we talk about submission, I think it's important first to talk about what it is not. I grew up with the understanding that Christianity, when Jesus says, take up your cross, follow me, what that meant is you're supposed to be a doormat, right? You're supposed to be everybody's doormat. Oh, I'm weak, I'm poor, I'm evil, I'm decrepit. And this is us essentially taking Paul's writings and kind of taking them out of context. Woe is me. I'm evil. I'm not deserving of anything good. And so you, in turn, can trample on me because I deserve it. Does that sound to anyone healthy at all? If it does, you are experiencing sickness right now. And I want to give you a different perspective. Submission is not self-hatred or self-contempt. Submission is not me saying I'm not deserving and I'm not good. That's self-hatred. And that does not belong anywhere in this Christian journey. Here's what the Christian journey tells us. Here's what the ancients told us about us, life, creation. You were made in whose image? You were made in whose image? When will you accept that? When will you accept that? You were made in God's image. You were made good. You have potential and beauty to steer all of this freedom in beautiful, powerful, restorative ways. And because we have all this power and this potential and this beauty, we in turn can share that freedom with others. And we call that self-denial. It means this. It means when I have been freed, when I understand that I am valued, I no longer take my value from arguments and fights that I think I have to win. Richard Foster, I think, says it best. He says this, submission is the ability to lay down the terrible burden of needing to get your way. Is anyone finding this a bit hard to swallow? Submission. If you're like me, you have to win every battle. You have to fight on every hill. 
And you'll say, you'll, you'll carry it around like a badge. Well, I'm passionate. And you'll find that you're exhausted, really. Submission is laying down the burden of having to get your way all the time. Of always needing to be right. Submission frees us from having to always be number one. In Israel, they struggled with this. Because here's what they said. And again, praise the Lord, we've evolved, right? Because here's, here's some of the stuff that they sometimes got caught up in. They would go around and they would say, we're number one. We are the chosen. We are the remnant. And because of it, we deserve to be number one. We are the best. We're the best. We're number one. And so Israel, this became a stumbling block for them. And they struggled with submitting to God and each other and even their enemies. The message of Jesus is really difficult. Submit to your enemies. Submit to the people who are holding you captive. Love them. Are you kidding me? I have a hard time not imagining myself going ninja on someone that I don't like in a meeting. Wishing them well. The next meeting that we go to, if you're there, if you get this look from me. I just ninja'd you. Watch out. Israel struggled. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they all wrestle with God, with submission. Jonah wrestles with his calling until he ends up in the bottom of the ocean. He experiences death. He chooses not to submit. And so let me ask you this. What does your story look like? Are there places in your life that you are just refusing to submit to? Let me ask you the even more difficult question. Are there people in your life you are choosing not to submit to? Could it be your partner? Could it be a coworker or a friend that rubs you the wrong way? Every wrong way they can rub you, they rub you. Is it your boss who you're always like, I could do this better? Are you struggling with submission? What does your story look like? Your parents, I know they're, you know, they're 50 and they know nothing, obviously. At your age, at 17, 18, you know, right? You know better. What do they know? Submission is so painful. Submission is learning to take the trash out when your wife asks you to. Even though she said it with this bitterness to her voice. Honey, take the trash out. You know, she said it five times before. There was a game. It was important. Maybe learning to value and love that person and respect them enough to say that their need to be heard and respected is more important than my need to sit on my booty and watch a game. One of my, one of my uh, mentors, he said this, it may feel like captivity, but how you respond with grace and love will shape your very soul. We're in the business of soul shaping. And when we choose not to submit to one another, we are shaping our soul in certain ways. How will you shape your soul? It's learning to see that her need to be respected is more important than your need to be the man. No one tells me what to do. What a caveman thing to say, by the way. No one tells me what to do. You ever say that out loud? I do. I'm an idiot. No one tells me what to do. Think about what that means. No one tells me what to do. No one offers me advice. No one helps guide me when I'm sliding backwards. No one challenges the ridiculous thoughts I have. That sounds like a really boring, lonely, painful life that ends up in the bottom of the ocean. No one tells me what to do. Well, dummy, they should. You should listen, Tony. Have you ever fallen into this trap? You've thought this. 
if I could just get my way, if they would just listen, if I could just win this thing, if I could just do this thing, then I'd be happy. If they could just finally see it my way, because my way is what? The right way. If I could just get it my way this time. Can you imagine a life when everything you wanted, you got? How messed up would that be? One of my favorite movies at Christmas time. Favorite movies. Growing up, I had other reasons for it. I, I liked the lamp for a while. Sicko kid. When I watch it now, there's some interesting things I see. Because here's this kid. His name's Ralphie, right? Ralphie? Isn't it Ralphie? I feel like it's Ralphie. We'll say it's Ralphie. Ralphie, he wants the official Red Rider Carbine Action 200 shot range model air rifle. He wants a BB gun. And the whole movie is him saying, I need this. I must have this. But the problem is the wisdom of the ancients who surround him all say what? Yell, shoot your eye out, kid. <laughs> he even goes to Santa Claus himself. And he's like, Santa. He thinks he's got it. Santa, I need this BB gun. And Santa, <laughs> yell, shoot your eye out, kid. He's like, no, even Santa's against me. But then in a turn of irony at the very end, he gets it. He gets what he wants. Finally, everyone's seen the light. He gets what he wants. He shoots something. It ricochets and it hits him where? In the eye. (sighs) How many times did you get your way only to realize that was painful? You got your way. You battled. You fought. And in the end, the relationship was severed. The job was gone. The thing is done. And now you got black eyes and you are in pain because you had to die on that hill. Sometimes when we get there, it takes some moments of reflection. And this is the Jonah story in the whale. And it starts as a poem. It starts as a psalm. It looks like this. Every psalm has a format. And this is what happens when a character goes into some issues and some distress. There's, there's a moment of distress where they realize, oh no, I just got a bunch of black eyes. That was painful. I got what I wanted. I shouldn't have gotten what I wanted. And then they pray to God, where are you in my distress? And then God gives them an awareness. I was here the whole time. I was the old man with the beard telling you, you're going to shoot your eye out, kid. I was this, I was that. I was telling you over and over again, the direction you're going is not a good one. You're going to shoot your eye out, kid. And then you have an, uh, this awareness and then the response comes, oh Lord, you are good. And you head in the right direction and you give thanks to the Lord because he is good and his advice has proven good. And so the story of Jonah really starts in Jonah chapter one, verse 17 of him in the whale. And it goes like this. Now the Lord provided a great fish. Notice this great. What kind of city is Nineveh? It's great. What kind of storm is it? It's great. What kind of pot roast was that? It's great. (laughs) Everything's great when you're reading an epic story, right? Wahi, it happened on a day like this. Bigger, 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 everything big. And this is the way that the story is told. Big, big, big. And we're told the whale swallows Jonah whole. The fish, the whale, whatever, swallows Jonah whole. The word swallow here means to rescue. Isn't that interesting? He wasn't hungry. We're not talking about some fish needing hunger or whatever in this interesting tale. No. Jonah goes down to the bottom of the depths. He dies, is what the story tells us. And the whale comes and rescues him from the clutches of death. Where in your story have you experienced these moments? You got what you wanted, everything falls apart. But somewhere, somehow, there was rescue. I'm so thankful for those moments of rescue. Three days and three nights I've heard over and over again people say this. Jonah is the Jesus character. Over and over again. See, three days, three nights. Jonah, the anti-prophet, the one that chose not to follow God, he's Jesus. 
He's the messianic character you want to... No, I'm sorry. And please stop making all these interesting timelines to try to figure out geopolitical events from this story of Jonah. It adds up in weird ways and it makes you look a little silly. Jonah teaches us something even more beautiful than that. Here's what it teaches us. Three days, three nights in the, in the ancient world when they talked about a time period where there was, there was, there was certain things that would happen, it seemed like a long time. But there was always resurrection at the end if you chose it. There was always new life. In this time period, they had different times they would choose, but three days and three nights is one of them. Any of you guys taking notes? Here you go. Just so you know, I'm not lying to you. First Kings 19.8, Exodus 24.18, Nehemiah 2.11, Ezra 8.32. These are places you'll find these three days, three nights concepts. When you have made a huge mess of things, when you fought the battle, you shouldn't have. When you didn't submit to one another and there is a lot of china broken on the kitchen floor, there is still hope. There is still hope for your relationships, your occupations, your life. There is still hope. There is still resurrection. So good. So good. Keep going. In the belly of the whale is where Jonah is found. Now there is this word in the Hebrew, it's called doga. Doga. And doga is really a painful thing for me. Here's what doga means. The stubbornness in all of us that dies when we are forced to finally surrender. The stubbornness in all of us that dies when finally everything has gone to crap. It's just gone there. And that's the best word I can think of to describe it. It's gone to Sheol. And now you are forced to submit. Is this your story? Doga. Are you the kind of person that has to face Doga. Until things finally click? Do you have to fight all the time? Does everything need to be a battle and a huge, long, drawn out discussion and fight? Because honestly, I have to tell you this it's exhausting for me. I get so exhausted when I am that person. It's just exhausting. It ruins relationship. It ruins my life. Doga. Some of us get this. Some of us know this, and maybe the first step is simply being aware that maybe we need to submit to not die on every hill. Not every argument has to end in which you leave the house or you threaten to quit. It doesn't have to end that way. Submission helps us lay down this terrible burden and these terrible cycles. When we don't, we experience Sheol. We're told Jonah continues to go further and further down. He won't submit. He won't share with his enemies messages of challenge and hope. And so he goes further and further down. This word Sheol... It doesn't actually mean a, a special place where people that you don't like burn for eternity and they hope you burn there too. There'd be a whole lot of people down there burning, let's just be honest. Sheol actually means this. It means the place of death where you die. Jonah in this psalm dies. That's not on the felt board, is it? Hey kids, Jonah, he dies. See that seaweed around his neck? It killed him. We don't talk about that, do we? That's what happens in this psalm. He goes down to the depths. Rather than going up to the mountains where God is calling him, he goes down to the depths. He experiences death, brokenness. And for Israel, this is a really valuable lesson. When you choose not to submit, you end up broken and broken and broken and hurting in captivity, exile over and over and over again. When we choose not to submit, we experience 
death, we experience Sheol. But the beautiful thing is there is hope around the corner. And here's what happens to Jonah. We're told that the whale, it does what? No one wants to say vomit. I like that word here. (laughs) It's like that picture, don't you? It's an interesting picture. He vomits him up. Spitting up. Well, you know, you can spit. That's not a huge deal. You guys have gotten quite a bit of spit on you just from this few minutes of me speaking. But vomit. Ugh, that's gross. (laughs) Like, that's kind of gross. That's real gross. And so is your story when you finally get vomited up, isn't it? It's painful. You go places that you have conversations that are painful. You experience these moments where things are drudged up and you have to deal with those people that you demonized and hurt and battled with. It's not, it's not easy. It's kind of sticky. It stinks. But you end up on dry land. And for any ancient person during this time period, the understood sailors and the sea, the mysteriousness of the sea, they understood that sailors would spend weeks, sometimes months out on sea, and they'd be gathering all these fish. And what would happen is they'd be terrified the majority of the time. They didn't know what was underneath. We know more about space still today than we do about our own ocean. Interesting. And so they were terrified. And they were always asking God this, please get us back home safely. Please get us back to our homeland. The same thing that the Israelites are asking and the same thing you and I ask. How do we get back home? And so Jonah, we're told, finally, he gets it. He submits and he heads west again. He heads toward home. He heads toward Nineveh where repair and restoration will begin He essentially says, I resolve to follow the things that bring life. I choose to love others over my constant need to be right or to get revenge. I choose to show mercy even though I feel like this person deserves a punch in the face. I choose to show love even when I'm being mistreated. I choose to submit to live love. Two weeks ago, some of my, my friends, two of them, they said, meet up, let's go to Starbucks. It might have been my suggestion, actually. Big surprise. And so I got there early because I was going to do some work. And <clears throat> as I'm there, I'm walking up to the door, and I go to grab the handle. And what happens is an interesting, awkward moment because there's another person with a briefcase and a nice suit and, 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 and they look important, but they also look really hurried and frustrated. They look like they just dealt with Orange County traffic. And so he grabs the door, I grab the door, and we're... <laughs> and in my mind, something awful happened. <laughs> I had a terrible, awful idea. <laughs> the Grinch had a terrible... So I grabbed it. And I looked at him and I thought, I need to get coffee. I need my petrol. And then another weird idea happened, and maybe it came from what I ate that morning, I don't know. But I thought, what are you doing, dummy? Let the man in. Let him go first. You don't have to be first. And so I said, no, allow me. And I grabbed the door and I did this. And the man, I'll never forget his face, he did this. <laughs> he looked at me like I was a suspect. I'm sure he thought I was going to try to rob him of his briefcase. I said, no, after you. Please go after you. And we stop and we go. What happens at a you know, four-way stop, everyone and no one goes. And finally he goes. And then when he gets in line, he stands there, and then I walk up behind him, and I realize my mistake (laughs) by allowing him to go first. Now he's in line before me, and this line is huge, and there are like two people, and they're working very slowly on their craft. 
And the man looks at me and he realizes what happened. And he says, hey, hey, why don't you go ahead of me? It looks like a long line. And again, what I ate, I don't know. (laughs) I looked at the man. I said, hey, not a big deal. Not a big deal. I got plenty of time. (laughs) And then what happened next, it was one of those weird moments. Because the man... He kind of looked down, and then he looked back up, and he had these watery eyes. And he said, every day I take this same drive, and I deal with terrible traffic. I am always so rattled when I get here to work at this bank. Today, you made me feel human again. Today you made me feel human again. And I realized it wasn't uh, indigestion. It was the spirit of the Lord coming out of me. And I realized in this moment, all of us need to experience these moments where we feel human again. Everyone, no matter your age, class, reputation, enemy, or friend, we all need to feel valued We all need to feel human and learning to submit to others, learning to submit to God, learning to place others' needs sometimes above our own is sometimes the first step toward real new life resurrection. I sat with my best friend on the floor and we started talking. And as I'm talking to my best friend, There's this moment in my mind where I thought, Tony, just listen. You don't have to argue. You don't have to be right. Just listen. And so I did. And there were these really painful things that were brought up about the past. And my best friend and I, we started to move through some of these painful things that we had experienced. And we started talking about them. And it was so beautiful. And I can tell you this, the relationship, it breathed again. It breathed again. And I listened to my friend, my best friend in the world. And I felt so connected again. Sometimes to experience resurrection, we need to remember that we are free and we are free to listen and love and share that same freedom with those that we love. Sometimes we need to submit to God and share the message of love, hope, challenge. Sometimes it even means sharing that same message with our enemies. Sometimes we need to learn to take the trash out. Not because we're slaves, but because we're free. And freedom means that I can share that freedom with you without feeling like I gave up some of my value, but because I can learn to value you just as much as I am valued as well. When you do this, you turn prison into a beautiful garden. You turn Starbucks into a place where people begin to see the beauty of their humanity again. You turn simple chores into acts of love. And maybe this is the beauty of the Jonah story in the belly of the whale. Is that he in the belly of the whale has a moment where he realizes he is free. Start living free. And when you do that, when you submit that to God and to your neighbor, you experience the kind of life that Jesus talked about, where the kingdom of heaven happens here and now in authentic, beautiful, compassionate, merciful ways. That is my hope for you today.